Good morning and welcome to worship. It's at Armand's Key Lutheran Church. Whether you're joining us live at nine o'clock for our broadcast on Facebook and our church website, or whether you're joining us later in the day or even later in the week as part of our video archive, you're very welcome today. Uh, please continue to keep each other in prayer. Please continue to make phone calls and wherever safe, reach out um, to family, friends, loved ones, uh, and fellow members of St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. Uh, we have a system of phone calls that we make here to check in on folks, but, but that can only, by definition, be once in a while. And so we rely on, on folks to reach out to folks they love. And just say hello, say that you're being thought of, uh, and say that you're being loved, even from a distance. Please do that for me. And as we continue to inch towards the time when we can worship in person, please be patient as the leadership of St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church wrestles with all the complexity and the multiplicity of options that lie before us, always trying to choose the safest and the best based on the very best advice we have at the time. It's not easy, it won't be pretty, and it won't please everyone. But please pray for us, pray, pray for the leadership of this congregation as we discern what is good and right and proper. But welcome to worship. But you might have noticed over these past few weeks there is a familiar cast of characters. And one of the people who is part of that cast of characters is my beloved wife, Amy, whose birthday it is today. And so as a point of privilege, can we join in singing happy birthday? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Amy, happy birthday to you. <laughs> and now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God, and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, our shepherd, you know your sheep by name and lead us to safety through the valleys of death. Guide us by your voice that we may walk in certainty and security to the joyous feast prepared in your house through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Morning. Our first reading is taken from the second chapter of Acts. 
The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is taken from the second chapter of 1 Peter. It is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Go. 
Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and life abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Before I came to St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church, I served Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Hernando, Florida, where many of our best friends still worship. So the phrase Good Shepherd means a lot to Amy and Rob and Grace and I. Just as the concept of Jesus as the Good Shepherd means so much to so many people down through the centuries. But you know, it hadn't occurred to me until relatively recently, so familiar I am with the concept of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, that why, why Good Shepherd? Why not just Shepherd? Surely there's an implication there that there are bad shepherds. That isn't fully teased out in the Gospel text, nor is it fully visible or even slightly visible, or even implied in the 23rd Psalm, which is one of those sort of touchstone texts for, for Jesus as the Good Shepherd. It's a psalm that we are so incredibly familiar with that means so much to so many of us. So wh where do we hear what a Good Shepherd looks like compared and contrasted with a bad shepherd? And the text we have to go to is Ezekiel chapter 34. Now, it's, it's too long a text to read here and now embedded in a sermon, but if you go online, you'll find my devotion for this week, just as you find my devotional writing for each week, which seems like a good time to remind you that if you haven't signed up for Connections, the St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church electronic bi-weekly newsletter, you really ought to. Go to our website, you'll find a button there, click up, sign up, and be connected to this community of faith. So in my devotion for this week, you see a significant part of chapter 34 of the book of Ezekiel printed. Or here's a radical thought. Crack open the spine of your Bible on your bookshelf and read it there. God speaks to the people through the prophet. And God says, you have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick, you have not bound up the injured, you have not brought back the strayed, you have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled them. There's the definition of a bad shepherd. God, through the prophet, speaking to the leaders of the people and saying, here's what you haven't done. Here's what you've left undone. Here are the people to whom you have paid not a blind bit of notice. They still suffer. They still stray. They're still lost. They're still alone. All of that love goes unshown. 
the working definition of a bad shepherd. Because elsewhere in this chapter in Ezekiel, God refers to himself as the shepherd, and what does the shepherd do? Now, we have this image of shepherd as the one who bends the flock to his will. We have this mental image of of the shepherd being the one who manipulates the flock so that they go where he wants them to go and do what he wants them to do. But that's not the image of the good, righteous shepherd in Ezekiel 34. The promise God makes is to be the opposite of those bad shepherds. I, said God, will seek the lost and bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. They shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, like the house of Israel, are my people. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, says the Lord God. It's in that context that Jesus, in John's Gospel, speaks of himself as shepherd. Yes, the kings of Israel were shepherds. Yes, in the ancient Near East, the ruler was the good shepherd. Yes, even the Pharaoh carried a staff that indicated that he was some kind of shepherd. But all of those shepherds ruled and manipulated and used the people. Jesus is the good shepherd because he comes to love them. The image of Jesus as the good shepherd is an image of love shown in response to the deepest longings of people. I mean, isn't that true? That's not some fancy theological concept, surely. Part of a deep-seated human longing is to be loved, is to be cared for, is to be nurtured. Part of the deep-seated human longing is that when we are sick, someone will tend to us. When we are broken, someone will bind us up. When we are alone, someone will come alongside us so that loneliness becomes a thing of the past. And that if we are lost, someone will care enough to come after us and find us. And like Christ the Good Shepherd, not stand there and lecture us for bad choices made or wrong turns taken. Good God in heaven, we've all done plenty of that, have we not? And the last thing we need is to be reminded just how much we've screwed up. No. Jesus, the good shepherd, founds the lost, places that lost sheep on his shoulder, and brings that lost sheep home, back into the community. That's Christ, the shepherd, of the sheep. And you might say to yourself, well, there are limits, aren't there? And the scriptural answer is, no, there are no limits to the distance that God will go to find us. Psalm 139 is an incredible psalm. I'm not going to quote it now. Again, go back to your bookshelf, blow the dust off the top of your Bible, open it up and read it. It is incredible. The psalmist describes the extent to which he might go to flee from God. Uh, The context being one of shame. But the psalmist acknowledges the lengths to which God will go to find him, to find her, to find them. Even the psalmist says, if I make my home in Sheol, which by twists and turns of theology, scripture, and fate became in the Christian imagery, hell. Even if I find myself in hell, you, God, will search me out and find me. That's not just an image of shepherding. That's not just an image of love. That is an image of incredibly amazing grace. That God will find us. And and here too is the good news. And in a wonderful phrase, I think Anne Lamott sums it up beautifully. And I quote, 
I do not understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are and does not leave us where it found us. Doesn't that stand another saying? I do not understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are and does not leave us where it found us. How radically different life would be if we saw life day in and day out through all its changes and chances. 24-7, 365. If the first thing that occurred to us when we got out of bed in the morning was that we are surrounded by amazing grace, how would we see the world then? On Facebook this week, I came across a cartoon, just one of those single-cell cartoons. I'll, I'll speak nicely to Michael, and, and maybe it'll end up on Facebook, on the church Facebook page today sometime. No pressure, Michael. It was, and I know this sounds strange, but you know, bear with me for a couple of minutes. It was a cartoon of a painter, and the painter just happened to be a rhinoceros. Okay, you still with me? And just over a ways from the rhinoceros, on a beautiful chaise lounge, is another rhinoceros posing for her portrait. And you can see between the two of them the canvas on which the rhinoceros was painting. And there at the back of the canvas, you could see this beautiful rhinoceros posing. But in front, you could see an enormous horn. And on the wall behind the person posing are other paintings that this rhinoceros has painted, and all of them have an enormous horn in the foreground. Because the rhinoceros sees the horn on the end of its nose before he sees anything else, and everything else he sees and everything else he paints has an enormous horn in it. And I know that sounds frivolous, but whatever is front and center, whatever is in our foreground, whatever it is that occupies our mind above all else, that's how we see the world. The world and its needs and its challenges and its joys and its beauties will always lie just the other side of that whatever, of that slight or that wound, of, of that injury, of that betrayal, of that sadness. Whatever it is that's immediately in front of our eyes will distort everything behind it, which is everything else in life. You see, the power of having something as beautiful and wonderful as Christ the Good Shepherd, loving us in answer to our deepest longings, to have that be the thing in our foreground which casts its shade on everything beyond in our daily life. How different would be our responses? But I've got to confess that sometimes we can overly romanticize the image of Christ the Good Shepherd. Have you ever watched shepherds working with sheep? The shepherd and the sheep find themselves in the muck and the filth of life. It's not clean, it's not pristine, it's not pretty. There's very little about farming that's clean and pretty. It's down and dirty. We have a God who will meet us in the muck of life, find us there, love us there. And I know Lutherans have a greater idea of the Christian life than trying to pretend that we're Jesus. Although Luther does say, say, you know, you can try to be little Jesuses to each other. There are worse things in life. But I think that imagery of sacrificial love in the dirt and the filth and the chances and the changes of life is a pretty good description of the Christian life itself. The life I alluded to a moment ago seen constantly through the eyes of faith, which is to see the world constantly through the eyes of the Good Shepherd who loves us 
and cares for us and walks with us. So I know that the old doggerel is true. God comes to comfort the afflicted. But sometimes he also afflicts the comfortable. And life sometimes can be anything but comfortable. At times like that, it's common to say, where is God? And God is the same place God has always been. In the muck and the filth of life, in the changes and chances of life, surrounding us with love in the midst of the betrayals of life and the disappointments of life and lifting our eyes up to see the joys of life and the wonders of life and the awesome nature of life in community with each other even when community with each other doesn't look pretty. Now I know that Christians have this eye on the prize keeping somewhere in our sight, no matter how far away it may seem, the image of heaven and of arriving at the kingdom of God. But there's a danger in constantly looking at the destination and paying not a blind bit of notice to the journey to the road we walk on and the people we encounter, the sights we see and the opportunities to share love that come our way when we draw alongside each other for a season, for a lifetime. The Christian life is lived out in community, but it's community on a journey. Amy will tell you that whenever my copy of The Economist arrives at the house, and this isn't meant to sound as morbid as it does sound, I turn to the back page to read the obituary. It's the first thing I read. I just always have. I know, I'm weird, am I? No comment. Rhetorical question. In the latest edition of The Economist, there's an obituary uh, for Joe Brown. He died age 89, and at the age of 89, he was the greatest British climber of the century. He was the one that conquered the old man of Hoy off the coast of Scotland, found new ways to traverse incredibly different, difficult slopes in Mont Blanc. He even was the one that conquered the third highest peak in the Himalayas, a, a peak that was notorious for its difficulty, never mind its altitude. Kanchenjunga is the name of the peak. And the King of Nepal told Joe Brown and the party that he led that that mountain was sacred and they should not stand on the top of it. So after battling their way up the rock of that mountain, they stopped four feet from the summit. Later, Joe Brown was asked, did it not seem terribly anticlimactic <laughs> to be the first person to conquer that mountain but not stand on top of it? And Joe Brown said, no, it wasn't disappointing at all. I, I'm not one for planting flags. I'm all about the climb. The destination didn't particularly matter to him. It was the route he took to get there. It was the challenge of overcoming incredible obstacles and difficulties even if for whatever reason, spurious or otherwise, he wasn't able to stand on the peak. The journey was what it was all about. And so too for Christians. Even as we journey through COVID-19, through a worldwide pandemic, and all of the immense uncertainties that come with that. We've come kicking and screaming through it. But that's all right, because that's what the journey to the kingdom looks like. Even C.S. Lewis, that great English Christian writer, he wrote this about his conversion to Christianity, because faith came to him later in life. And so he wrote in this book, Surprised by Joy, that he was the most dejected, 
reluctant convert in all England, drug into the kingdom, kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape. <laughs> Isn't that great? Years ago, Fulton J. Sheen, the great Roman Catholic bishop of blessed memory, once spoke to the upper New York district of the Lutheran church. And no one can quite remember every word he said, but everyone that was there that day remembers the title of his address. The address he gave to this group of Lutherans was, kicking and screaming, I will enter the kingdom of God. Kicking and screaming because of the journey. So I want to leave you today with a poem, which kind of sums up the struggles of the journey, but what Christians are called to experience and to live out on the journey. It's a very brief poem by Janet Chester Bly. I would rather clutch my invitation and wait my turn in party clothes, prim and proper, safe and clean. But a pulsing hand keeps driving me over peaks, ravines and spidered brambles. And so I will pant up to the pearled knocker tattered, breathless, and full of tales. Amen. Together we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, true God begotten of the Father, of one God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, as is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Let us pray. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Shepherding God, we thank you for the educational ministries of your church. Enrich the work of teachers, professor, professors, mentors, advisors, and faculty at colleges, seminaries, and learning sites. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creating God, we praise you for those who maintain and operate farm equipment, for those who plant and harvest crops, for local farmers markets, and for those involved in agriculture of any kind. Strengthen their hands as they feed the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guiding God, no one should be in want. Bid the nations to return to your paths of righteousness and inspire our leaders to walk in your ways so that all may have the opportunity to live abundantly and sustainably. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comforting God, you carry us tenderly. We pray for those who walk through dark valleys overshadowed by anxiety and overwhelmed with suffering, especially David Barth, Jack Bill, Thomas Bond, Adam Carmona, Denise Collins, Georgia Cotter, Pastor Elwood Culp, Tina Diet, Carol Elliott, Charlene Favor, Lori Golnick, Nancy Hargrove, Louise Hauser, Cal and Joanne Hawks, Don Horn, Wayne Kafler Sr., Peggy Lawrence, Annie Linscott, Wilma Lynch, Benjamin Maust, Sam Myers, Ann Mongillo, David Moore, Carrie Morrison, Emily Nowakowski, Chuck Reed, Juan Restrepo, Howard Rooks, Barbara Russell, Mary Ellen Shoup, Dolores Smith, Iga Stewart, Casey Taylor, Barbara Teller, Alexandra Zalek, Veronica Zalek, Helen Zielinski, and those we name at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Nurturing God, you desire justice for the hungry. Bless advocacy work, food pantries, and feeding ministries in our congregation. May none of our neighbors lack for basic needs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Open our lives, O oh God, in the midst of this pandemic. For all who have contracted coronavirus, we pray for care and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who experience fear or anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Everlasting God, your beloved have heard your voice. You have called them by name and guided them to your side in death. We thank you for their lives of faithful witness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord.
gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forevermore. Amen. Christ is risen, just as he said. Go in peace, share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.